Good afternoon, and welcome to the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council's program featuring Dr. Kathleen Keenest. And on today's topic, which is why women peace builders matter, it's uh, certainly appropriate for International Women's Day. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Janet Linus. I'm the president of the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council board this year. This year marks the 40th anniversary of Iowa City Foreign Relations Council, otherwise known as ICFRC. Uh, and we're celebrating our, with our supporters, our legacy in the community, and the bright future ahead for our organization that features internationally, features speakers and topics. And we hope that if this is the first time, it will not be your last time joining us. So for those of you who have been with us for the 40 years, we appreciate you being here as well. So. Uh, we are deeply, deeply appreciative of the longstanding support that we have had in our community. Many who are with us here today, as I mentioned, uh, your help has allowed our organization to grow for 40 years, hosting speaker programs with experts joining us in person and from around the world. Uh, that's been a great new feature and something we learned that was a positive from the pandemic. <laughs> so uh, as today, we're going to have our speaker who's coming to us from Washington, DC. It really does help make the world feel a little smaller and that we can gain a lot more knowledge this way. As a small nonprofit, we exist because of the generosity of individuals like you as well. We also extend our heartfelt thanks to those joining us virtually or watching the program broadcast online or on City Channel 4. You may not be with us in person, but you are an integral part of our community in spirit. Um, I hope all of you will consider making a financial contribution today by scanning one of our QR codes in the room, which are all on your tables. You can do that, or there's signs over there as well. Um, or you can visit us on icfrc.org on our website and contribute that way. We try to make these programs free uh, so that we can have as many people participate as possible, but we need your help to make sure we can continue that. And finally, I want to thank our sponsors and our community partners for their support. This list includes the Iowa Arts Council through the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs, Humanities Iowa, and the National Endowment for the Humanities, the University of Iowa's International Programs, Honors Programs, and Public Policy Center the Stanley U of I Foundation Support Organization, Midwest One Bank, City Channel 4 for providing online access to our programs along with the U of I Library Archives, and of course, the Iowa City Public Library for their partnership providing our new home here, as well as our refreshments that are being served today. So um, thank you so much to the Iowa City Public Library. They also have been doing the setup for us. So let's give a round of applause to them. <laughs> ICFRC has adopted the Native American Land Acknowledgement prepared for the City of Iowa City's Ad Hoc Truth and Reconciliation Commission and Human Rights Commission. The ICFRC recognizes that our home community of Iowa City now occupies the homelands of Native American nations to whom we owe our commitment and dedication. The full text of ICFRC's acknowledgement is in our website at icfrc.org. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Dr. Kathleen Keenest is the director of the Women, Peace, and Security Portfolio at USIP, where she oversees the Institute's work on the gendered impacts of violent conflict, drawing upon UN Security Council Resolution 1325, emphasizing the critical role women play in all aspects of peace building. Since 2012, Dr. Keenis has served as a founding member of the Missing Peace in in Initiative, which is focused on ending conflict-related sexual violence by bringing a survivor-centered focus to research, policy, and practice. Since 2010, she has also spearheaded the U.S. Civil Society Work Group on Women, Peace, and Security, of which USIP is the secretariat. Before USIP, Dr. Kinest worked in the international development field, primarily with the World Bank, where her role as a senior social scientist included research and project management on the thematic themes of women and poverty, social capital, and community-driven development in fragile and post-conflict societies. Her regional expertise is in Central Asia, 
where she lived for several years during the initial years of the post-Soviet period in Kyrgyzstan, completing her doctoral dissertate, dissertation research. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kathleen Keenest, who will talk about why women peace builders matter. Thank you. Good afternoon. On behalf of the U.S. Institute of Peace, I want to offer sincere thanks to all of you and to the Iowa City Foreign Affairs Council for hosting this discussion today. And thank you especially, Peter and Janet. We appreciate your partnership with USIP. As the daughter, granddaughter, and great-granddaughter of Iowans, it is particularly special for me to be with you all here today. And indeed, we celebrate International Women's Day, recognized each year on March 8th. During our time together, I want to share with you a bit of my background, the work of the United States Institute of Peace, and specifically one of our key endeavors of the past four years, the Women Building Peace Award. USIP is a national and nonpartisan independent institution founded by the U.S. Congress in 1984. So I guess we're the same age as the Iowa City Foreign Affairs Council. So congratulations to you all. Uh, we are also celebrating our 40th year. And we see ourselves as an institution that is founded on the concept of a world without violent conflict, that it is actually possible, practical, and essential for US and global security. It's interesting to note that USIP was created as a result of two decades of work inside and outside of Congress to establish a national institution focused on making peace. And paraphrasing George Washington here, who was our first president, he remarked when the government was being established, if I'm going to have an office of war, then I want an office of peace, as peace is far more difficult to navigate than any war. Beginning in the 1960s, this effort for an office of peace was led by a bipartisan group of World War II veterans that were deeply affected by the experience and never wanted to see another world war. Instead, they wanted to see peace efforts in parallel with the nation's four military service academies, therefore urging the creation of an institution that would really consider the study and the practice of peace and peace building as seriously as that of the study of war. Forty years later, you will find our staff not only here in Washington, but in 26 locations around the world in some of the most difficult places, often conflict zones, working at the community level and also with regional and national governments focused on really connecting the issues of top-down and bottom-up uh, initiatives on building and sustaining peace. So you might wonder how the daughter of two Iowa farm kids ended up as the Director of Women, Peace and Security at the U.S. Institute of Peace and what in the world do I actually do every day? Well, that answer is really far too long for this talk, but put simply, I did begin as a social cultural anthropologist researching on the ground how Soviet gender policy affected Central Asian women. And while I was there, suddenly, I mean suddenly, the Soviet Union collapsed. And I witnessed firsthand uh, the perils of women impoverishment and their rights in many places taken away. That alerted me at a great level that every day our rights must be protected. So I'd like to explain what I do here every day to help make what I call the invisible visible, that is women. I'm involved in the work of ensuring that women are counted not only uh, when it comes to the impact of violent conflict on their lives, but also when it comes to bringing their knowledge, experience, diversity to both informal and formal processes of building peace. 
Although women in every society have played key roles throughout history in ending and preventing conflict, their efforts are really too often overlooked, undervalued, not written about, and USIP is working to change that notion. One of the ways we have been doing it over the last four years has been through the USIP Women Building Peace Award, which is really about making grassroots women who are working on very um, often dangerous spaces working toward peace and really making them visible. One week ago, we had the privilege of hosting a ceremony that recognized our most recent awardee, Madame Petroni Voveka, with our for fourth international award. Petroni, whose building, peace building work is in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, has been a fearless mediator working in some of the most dangerous places in her country to end the violence and to free hostages. As Viveka states, the DRC, its acronym of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, is a treasury of minerals, including an estimated 70% of the world's known cobalt, a vital component of lithium iron batteries for things like phones electric vehicles, and other products. For decades, the smuggling and the stealing of gold, copper, and cobalt has led to extreme brutality by armed actors from within the DRC and neighboring countries seeking control of these mines. Petroni, over the last four decades, has dedicated her life, her work, to really negotiating with some of the meanest, toughest guys around. She is fearless, and yet they trust her, and so do the people around her. She has been able to figure a way to respect all of the players and make peace possible in a very difficult setting. I want to share with you now a short video vignette of Petroni and her work. Okay, I'll be right back with you and I'll start the video. Je m'appelle Vaweka Petronil et je viens de Bounia, dans la province de Lituri. Je travaille sur toute la province de Lituri et même sur tout le pays. Dans mon travail, le thème que j'utilise jusqu'à aujourd'hui, c'est la cohabitation pacifique. Que les gens sachent régler leurs conflits en amiable et puis la cohésion sociale pour que les gens puissent se mettre ensemble pour se développer. Il y avait euh, la guerre entre les Hema et les Lendou. On tuait les gens du matin au soir. Tout le monde était, et ils ont fui chez eux. Et, euh, je ne pouvais rien faire que d'essayer d'arrêter cette guerre-là pour arrêter les tueries des femmes, des enfants et de toutes personnes innocentes. Elle était la seule femme qui devait aller retrouver les groupes armés dans leur cachette, là où ils habitent. Mais elle n'avait pas peur. Elle devait aller parler à chaque membre des groupes armés pour qu'ils déposent les armes. Et remis la justice. Les écoles ont repris, les églises. Les grands problèmes que je rencontre, c'est avec qui n'aiment pas la paix. Ceux qui donnent l'argent pour les groupes armés pour qu'ils puissent se battre. Ce sont des personnes qui ont toujours cherché à me tuer. Quand votre case brûle, 
vous n'allez pas laisser votre maison brûler, vous allez essayer d'éteindre le feu. Et moi, ma vie, c'est d'essayer d'éteindre le feu, d'éteindre la guerre et d'éteindre le conflit. Okay, we're back. That's just a kind of a sense of who this woman is. And um, I will make sure you all have uh, the link to our website so you can learn so much more about Patroni. Uh, she's a true inspiration to all of us. Um, I wanted to add one of the finalists to also this conversation this afternoon. Because of the extreme crisis happening right now, today, and for the last week in Haiti, I wanted to share with you and highlight one of the finalists, Dr. Marie Marcel Dichon. She is the deputy executive director at the head of the women's uh, clinic research at the Geskio Center in Port-au-Prince. She uh, has in her own peace building work, brought healthcare and humanitarian support to Haiti's most vulnerable populations as the social fabric of her country absolutely is falling apart. First with the 2010 earthquake, and then more recently the assassination of Haiti's president in 2021. As we speak, uh, Dr. Duchamp is temporarily in Miami because she's unable to fly home because the violence that surged last week closed the international airport and frankly there's uh, chaos uh, ensuing as we speak. Let me uh, open up for the short video and I'll say a few more things about our work afterwards. My name is Marie Marcel Deschamps. I'm from Port-au-Prince, Haiti. My center where I am located since 1982 is in the middle of violence and crimes and gangs. We are surrounded by 20 well-armed gangs and surrounding us, there's around 120,000 families who live there who need our assistance. Education for me is a priority, primary education, vocational education, and health and human development. Those are my four targeted areas. All those people can go through the gang's lines, the war lines, and come to us for a service. For me, it's already a huge impact. Tout le monde est capable de nous, mais le former nous tout, de bon nous métier. Kids from four years old to 15, 16 years old can come here and pursue their education. It's priceless. It's the right example of the success of a program. It takes courage, determination. It's a non-stop. And so you start and you have to keep on going. Even in a war zone, you can accomplish activities where you bring peace around you. Okay, we're back. Peace builders like Patroni and Marie have really found their work bolstered by the efforts such as the UN Security Council Resolution 1325, which was passed 24 years ago in the Security Council. And it focuses on really a policy that has helped us address two major problems, the inordinate impact of violent conflict and war on women and girls and the crucial role that women should and must play in all peace processes. 
It calls for increasing the participation of women and incorporating gender perspectives in all peace and security efforts. Parties engaged in conflict must take special measures to protect women and girls from all forms of gender-based violence, especially rape and other forms of sexual violence that are particularly widespread during times of violent conflict. It is particularly gratifying to focus on the courageous efforts of so many women who work tirelessly to bring light and hope to some of humanity's darkest spaces. In today's complex and interconnected strategic landscape where global violence is on the rise and nearly half of all peace agreements fail within five years, we really cannot afford to neglect and exclude the field of peace building, some of its most effective practitioners, and that would be women. After decades of research, we really do know the more equal and the more rights women have in a society, the more likelihood the peacefulness of that country will be sustained. In other words, no rights, no peace. USIP has been long engaged in supporting women peace builders in countries affected by conflict including mediators in Colombia, helping women in Nigeria, the Sahel and Tanzania prevent violent extremism in their communities, and working to strengthen uh, the uh, ability for women security actors to have safe training spaces and to be able to be a key part of their police forces and security forces in the countries that they serve. We do hope that the Women Building Peace Award, and we recognize it's not the Nobel Peace Award, but nevertheless, it shines a light on the indelible contribution of women peace builders everywhere. And we believe it truly inspires future generations. These women, were not born to be peace builders. They were made peace builders by the unusual and extreme circumstances of their lives, whether it be gang warfare, violent conflicts, or climate disasters. These are the women who stepped up and show unbelievable courage and dedication to their fellow humanity. In closing, I want to just say that USIP is committed to such an annual award, which honors a woman peace builders, because this fits with our sense that peace is possible. And we know that it can be a reality. It just takes one woman at a time to make a difference. Thank you all. I look forward to hearing your questions a little later on in the program. I'm going to turn the uh, mic back to Janet, who will introduce our young researcher. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I am delighted to have somebody who lives here in Iowa City uh, and is a doctoral student at the University of Iowa in political science. Carly Millard is working on her dissertation which focuses on women's civil society organizations' roles in promoting peaceful conflict resolution and women's rights inclusion in, and inclusion in peace agreements. So I would like Carly, if you would, to come up and tell us a little bit about your research that you're doing. Hi, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I was very excited and no less than two professors told me that this event was happening. So I figured today would be a really good time to come and uh, learn what I could. Um, I am a fourth year doctoral student here in the political science department, as Janet said, and my dissertation is focusing on 
uh, the cooperation between women's civil society organizations. And, and one of the things that the WPS agenda calls for specifically is uh, the cooperation between the USIP and other governments and these local actors. Um, what I'm finding in my research um, is that it's really important for international mediators and international actors to facilitate the cooperation of women civil society organizations because oftentimes, and as we heard today, they're neglected in these peace building processes. Uh, my dissertation is specifically looking at formalized peace uh, agreements. So when civil wars go on for a certain number, they go on for quite some time, they are often ended in a peace agreement. Um, and there's opportunities for women to influence that agreement. But as I was finding going into my dissertation research, despite the UNSCR 1325's proclamation that women need to be included, they're still not. Um, so I, in some cases they are, and women are able to get in their demands into the peace agreement. And I was really curious to know why. Um, and it turns out uh, that I'm finding in my research that cooperation between women's organizations acts as this influence multiplier to borrow from the WPS website. So women working together with um, a unified purpose and a unified goal really helps them make a difference in the content of the peace agreements, things that they specifically care about rather than power sharing, they're thinking about indigenous rights rather than who's going to be in charge after the government uh, or after the war ends, they are going to advocate for women's rights and the rights of those who have been in, um, disproportionately affected by the Civil War. So this is a topic that's really important to me. Uh, women participating in formalized peace processes um, helps to prolong the length uh, of positive peace, so no, or excuse me, uh, length of time between civil wars. So I am really excited to hopefully one day share my work with the USIP and what we can do to further uh, enhance the cooperation activities between civil society organizations um, on the ground and international organizations, international non-governmental organizations, um, and then organizations like the USIP so that women have their say heard in these conflicts and what happens afterwards. Thank you. I have to say for International Women's Day, it's really encouraging to hear of women like Carly and the research they're doing. So thank you for your research. <laughs> So at this point, we will be happy to take your questions for Dr. Keenest. And so if you would just raise your hand if you have a question, and we will come around with a microphone so that we can hear it. Oh, there's one over there. I'm wondering about Sudan. Um, uh, is, the, <clears throat> is the International Institute for Peace how are they involved in Sudan and, and, and your opinion just in terms of what can the United States be doing um, to uh, end the starvation and the violence in Sudan, if anything? Thank you for your question. I, I didn't get your name, but I appreciate it. Um, Yes, to answer your first question, is USIP engaged in the conflict um, and peace building work, of course, of uh, the situation? And you're right, it's a horrific situation in Sudan. Yes, we are. We actually have been involved in Sudan for over a decade. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, since uh, South Sudan and Sudan separated, and Sudan, South Sudan became its own country. What can we do? Well, I can tell you directly that we are uh, on the ground. There's, we uh, have been working with, and uh, first of all, Carly, hat off to you. I really look forward to learning more about your research. But what Carly was talking about is exactly some of the work that we're doing in Sudan. Uh, 
women have a way of being able to sort out what is going on and how to help people and that is part of the peace uh, efforts but much of our work is done uh, uh, working with both sides of the conflict here uh, in this case two militaries one declared one not and uh, trying to figure out ways to bring them to some sort of peace treaty and and that is very much a uh, part of our work in mediation negotiation hi thank you very much for the talk um i was wondering about some of the more specific programming that the usip does in this wps agenda um i'm learning that there's a lot of funding that may be long-term versus short-term or like conferences uh, that are like one-time instances. So I'm wondering what the USIP is doing to uh, promote long-term and sustainable solutions for women in these peace building um, organizations or as peace builders themselves. Great, you have all afternoon. <laughs> no. Um let me just give you one example of an effort we've been uh, very engaged in since 2012, um, especially in parts of uh, Africa where uh, extremist groups like Al-Shabaab, as well as uh, Boko Haram have literally taken over communities. What we have been doing since 2012 is uh, helping women's groups come together and uh, really uh, work on a plan of action for how they themselves identify um, uh, either uh, people who have come to, uh, you know, to their communities uh, trying to either uh, take younger, even children, uh, but you know, uh, male soldiers into their ranks and how to begin to, at a ground level, resist uh, these kinds of movements. We've also really worked uh, to help these women's groups um, affiliate with um, their local police stations. Often in these setups or situations, uh, there aren't a lot of trust. There isn't a lot of trust between uh, the local police and these uh, women's uh, community groups. And so in trying to bring information and, and methods and, and kind of grassroots approaches, that has been a long-term commitment. And we've expanded now from Nigeria and now the Sahel, Tanzania, and uh, Kenya. So that, that's one example. Other examples are like the Missing Peace Initiative. And this would uh, be something that, Carly, uh, maybe something in the future that you'd want to engage in. We have worked with um, research scholars who specifically have been addressing the problem of the use of conflict-related sexual violence in uh, civil wars, or we know this is has occurred in Sudan, Ethiopia, of course, the latest. Uh, and um, we see that in helping bring this kind of research to policymakers, that our efforts at the government level can be more honed and can be more um, ground truth, if you if you will. And so that has also been a very long term effort. I will say every single regional program that we have has been up and operating for nearly the last 20 years, if not longer. And so though we might do a lot of events here, much of our efforts are really on the ground working with people and they don't always have a, a programmatic name. Um, they are uh, addressing uh, the, the key problems of the of the situation at hand. Um, the last one I'll bring up is a, a report that just came out yesterday. Uh, it is a gender analysis of a place very far away in the Pacific, Papua New Guinea, 
which has one of the most uh, extreme rates of gender-based violence in the world. And so what we have been looking at is uh, the confluence of, again, in this case, oil and violence and the importing of small arms, all of that, how it's like the perfect storm in which uh, rates of violence have just skyrocketed. And you may be aware of some of these uh, through the news of late. I'll stop there in case there are other questions, but I can certainly come back to that. Good question, Carly. Thank you so much for your presentation today. Uh, my name is Catherine, and I'm wondering what are the biggest challenges you face in carrying out your important work? Wow. I think uh, this might surprise you, but I mean, we work in really some of the toughest places on earth. Um, and we work with people who are truly on the front lines. Um, some days when you hear the kind of brutality humans do to one another, you go home and you go, okay, what am I going to do? Uh, you, you can feel somewhat helpless and even hopeless at times. But, um, and I don't know if that, you know, qualifies as, you know, the most difficult, but, you know, uh, we, we have to maintain our own uh, mental health in this work and um, to be there for others uh, who are truly, you know, like Petronie and Marie, uh, daily uh, dealing with um, horrendous uh, violence. In terms of, um, you know, we're, we're a uniquely situated institution uh, you know, hopefully my opening remarks uh, help uh, just kind of paint a picture of uh, these World War II veterans who saw firsthand, uh, you know, war and its uh, its terrible sides, if I may, and uh, that they saw that you know that we actually need to study how peace is made. How how do like Carly's work, how do women's group come together to address local problems or or statewide pro problems? You know, trying to synthesize and, you know, I will say the last few years, even coming out of COVID, there have been so many conflicts in the world that, you know, trying to really meet the demand has been certainly something that all of us think about every day. In Ukraine and the conflict there, you always hear about Zelensky and you hear about Putin, but we never hear anything about the women. I'm just mm -hmm. curious as to if you folks are doing anything there or what you're doing? Yes, we are doing a lot. Um, and in fact, I'm really pleased uh, to share that in a month, uh, we will be joined by a, a Ukrainian woman who is right now at the University of Minnesota as a Hubert Humphrey fellow. She'll be joining USIP for um, part of the summer and uh, you know we will be learning directly from her work, which uh, she has uh, called the day after, because in fact we do have to prepare for when the war stops. And though at the moment we don't see quite an end in sight, uh, it is important to be thinking around that corner. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard on CNN, but Ambassador Bill Taylor is here at the U.S. Institute of Peace. He is a former ambassador to Ukraine and um, member of the State Department before and also uh, has been with us for quite a long time. They have been working for years, even prior to the second invasion of Russia, on uh, looking at peace approaches. Uh, Again, some of our work is just not out there. That is not what we do. We're not a, we're, 
we don't promote ourselves as such, but we uh, are all engaged directly with uh, what is happening in these countries. In terms of Ukrainian women, oh my goodness, uh, you know, they have led, you know, certainly after uh, 2014, have really led in organizing civil society and uh, strong leadership in terms of their commitment to democracy. That has been, uh, you know, really a, a, a strong mission in their efforts and, and of course, uh, in supporting uh, the Ukrainian uh, military. And, and, um, and there's, I think, it's not a large amount, but there are female uh, soldiers in this conflict uh, on the ground in uh, Ukraine. But absolutely very involved. If you go to USIP.org uh, and you know, please sign up and for our weekly newsletter, you'll get a sense of all the areas in the world that we're working on and the depth and breadth of the expertise that we bring to these regional and country conflicts. Hi, <clears throat> sorry, thank you. I was struck by something Petronie said about her biggest challenge being people who don't want peace. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious what you found in your work about creating incentives for peace or fostering a desire for peace and how you have seen that come about in your, in your experience. Yeah, that's a great question. And really, all of these are, are excellent questions. Yeah, Petroni, um, I think it's a great frustration to her uh, because, you know, so much of the violence in DRC is related to criminality. And criminality, I mean, you know, the, often criminality is one of those opportunities that happen in violent conflict is, uh, is what... What else can I get from uh, this, uh, this disorder and dysfunction in this uh, society? And I think it, it is terribly disheartening uh, for her when people, as she says, do not choose peace, that these are options. And, uh, you know, she says we need to educate at a young age for peace. You know, these are as George Washington said, it's much harder to navigate peace than it is to start a war. And I think that is really what our founding, in this case, founding fathers of this institution saw, that we really need to understand the art and science of peace building. And it is not uh, only a choice, but it is something that we have to work towards. It's, it's We always say here that Peace is not just negative peace, like, oh, now there's no fighting. Peace has to be something more in terms of, you know, it includes justice and rights and safety and uh, having shelter and food, all of the things that every human being has a right to. Hello, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I just have a quick question about how in your work you deal with the kind of the stereotypes and the expectations that are often put on women in regard to being nurturers and being, you know, peace builders, being um, caretakers and how you deal with that. And as you say, the fact that women are so necessary and integral to peace building. Thank you very much for that question. Yeah, we get caught in this kind of binary idea, women are peace builders, men make war, right? It's actually, um, we need to kind of bust that myth um, because uh, we know women can commit 
of acts of violence and criminality as well as any man. It just seems socially boys are more geared toward using violence as a tool uh, to solve problems. Uh, women have other tools to solve problems, sometimes not great tools. I, we always say in anthropology, gossip is the tool of the weak, you know, are those who have little power. They use gossip to control society. So I think it is uh, one of the problems um, when you don't have a lot of information about women, like women just have not up until maybe 50 years ago really uh, mattered in war and peace and so there that was the whole point of 1325 was to put women on the radar that not only are they victims but they're powerful actors when it comes to making change in a society um, but stereotypes lend themselves to the lack of information and uh, I think that is part of actually the thrust of the Women Building Peace Award, because though you can't, I couldn't share with you all, I think about 25 now, uh, awardees and finalists we've had over the four years, they are so diverse and their work is so diverse. And it, what we want to establish is how a woman and a peace builder has as many possibilities of how she goes about um, making peace in her work as anybody. And so it is important for us not to overemphasize like somehow this binary, but at the same time, it's equally important to bring visibility to what women are actually doing. and how they're doing it in the most extreme spaces and places because it really expands our like our imagination about what we can do as human beings to make a difference good afternoon and thank you so much um my name is eleanor and my question kind of comes from what you were just saying, which is those of us living with a great deal and in security and in, and in safety and with plenty, it may feel very overwhelming or sort of unreachable to work for peace. Um, what are some suggestions you would have that folks can do either collectively or individually at the local level, at the state level, at the communal level um, in order to work for peace? Uh, that's a great question. I think, really thank you, Eleanor, for ans asking that. I think there's a lot to be said for educating for peace. Um, one of the things we focus on a lot at the Institute is our uh, public-facing education to the United States. So we work with um, teachers, professors who work on peace education. We have a curriculum for teachers. Uh, we want to engage this as a serious subject, a difficult subject, because, you know, dealing with solving human differences and, and how to solve problems without resorting to violence is really, um, you know, something as a community, whatever community, large or small, we need to really come to terms with. Uh, the normalization of violence in all of our societies, I think, is you know, not missed by the children. And, you know, giving them options of understanding how to solve problems through other forms of activity besides violence. Um, learning how to talk in a group to facilitate and mediate differences uh, are, are key tools. I, I really I think we come at it as peace building has many different tools in the toolbox, if you will. But, uh, you know, we see communication as, as a key part of identifying where the problem is and how to find uh, nonviolent solution to that problem. 
we are the first to say that conflict is a kind of normal part of human society, but violent conflict doesn't have to be. So there's a difference. How do we solve our problems, everyday problems? In terms of, you know, globally engaging, uh, there are terrific NGOs uh, throughout this country and the world that work to support peace builders, both men and women, uh, gender and sexual minorities. They, it is all there, and you know, I'd be happy to send you information directly or direct you to our website where a lot of that information is housed. But uh, we see everyone has the potential to make a difference toward peace and for peace. So thank you for your question. Hi, my name's Brett. I was curious, do other countries have institutes of peace? And do you all get together? Wow, that's such a fun question because, no, <laughs> in fact, very few countries have an uh, institute of peace. I, I mean, I, I will say, you know, the brilliance of those senators who got together and you know, conceived of this institution, really, um, you know, putting uh, you know, something to paper and actually getting it passed through Congress uh, it says a lot. Um, there are, um, you know, you may recall uh, in the early 2000s uh, conflict south of the Philippines, the Mindanao conflict, um, they have reached out to us uh, to help set up an institute of peace. So it would be their own Mindanao Institute of Peace. Uh, so that has been most recent. Uh, the European Euro Union is looking into their own Institute of Peace, uh, but that is certainly something to talk about in terms of replicating this idea of being able to both respond at a governmental level. So we're, we're odd that way, we're quasi-governmental, and yet we're not under chief of mission when we go to Mindanao, for example. We can go directly there and meet with civil society, universities, um, even uh, armed actors. So it is, it is a really unique uh, space in which to do such peace building work. Well, I'm going to have one more question for you, especially considering this is International Women's Day. What advice do you have for all of us as we leave here going forward in terms of what we can do to help build peace? Hmm. Well, I think I would just uh, say uh, I'm going to quote somebody I heard this past week. It says, first, peace begins inside us then peace begins around us, and then we expand it out. I think there's really truth about that. Um, you have to know that kind of sense of uh, passion for solving problems uh, without violence, and also uh, inspiring and giving hope to those who feel like there is no hope. Um, I know it sounds very simplistic, perhaps, and I don't want it to sound like kumbaya, because um, peace building is really, really difficult. And uh, it is something that we don't take lightly. And we do think that there is an art and science to it. So uh, there are peace building courses all across the United States. If you'd like to know which universities they have them, please sign up, take one. Otherwise, we have um, a global campus. We have 30 courses that you can take for free. Just sign up and join one of our courses. We even have one on women, peace, and security. We'd love it if you would uh, want to take that as well. But these are really skill building uh, courses, everything from mediation to negotiation to uh, looking at reconciliation and reintegration. And so we have the full 
uh, uh, arena that you can look at peace building and choose which might be of use to you. But I really uh, thank you all for uh, such great questions for inviting me into your um, your meeting today. Uh, I felt like this was really special to me because I spent a lot of time in Iowa as a child and uh, it's in that way nice to come back home again. Thank you very much.